So we've been studying random sequences for quite a few lectures now. It's now time to turn our attention to random processes. So that's what we'll do over the next handful of videos. First, we just need to introduce what we mean by a random process. So just introduce that concept and provide some basic definitions of what a random process is. And then we're going to define some other quantities related to random processes. And all these quantities are going to be very similar to quantities we've already seen for random sequences. So for example, we'll talk about the mean function of a random process. We'll talk about the correlation function of a random process and things like that. We'll talk about strictly stationary random processes, things that you've heard in the context of random sequences, but now talked about in the context of a random process. After we've done these basic definitions and introduced the concept of a random process, then we'll actually turn our attention to studying a handful of very commonly encountered random processes, and this will give us an opportunity to apply these definitions and compute different properties and functions of these random processes. So we'll be computing mean functions and correlation functions and things like that, and just understanding how these different random processes, such as Poisson processes and phase shift keying and Wiener processes and things like that work. So before we actually get to the kind of formal or rigorous definition of a random process, let's just kind of put it in context with the random sequences we've been talking about. So we've been talking about random sequences, and the notation that we use for random sequence often looks like this. We either call it x of n, or if we want to be very explicit that this is indeed a sample function having done some experiment by grabbing some event out of the sample space, we write it as x of n comma zeta or x of n comma omega to indicate that we've actually grabbed something out of the event space, some zeta in capital omega or some little omega in capital omega. And the notation here of n just indicates that random sequences are function typically, or they actually are functions of this discrete index n. So n can be defined on any set, but typically for the things we do, we think of that set just being the normal positive and negative integers, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So these essentially turn out to be discrete random signals for the cases we've been examining. But now we're going to talk about random processes. Well, guess what? Things are almost the same way. The only difference is, is instead of having a discrete time index, we now have a continuous time index. So now we're talking about continuous valued functions, so we use the continuous parameter t, just like we did in undergrad when we talked about continuous time signals. Instead of using these square brackets, we use parentheses, just like we did in undergrad. For discrete signals in undergrad, we use the brackets, and for continuous time signals in undergrad courses, we always use the parentheses. And also, if we want to be very explicit about this random process as actually being the outcome of having done some draw from some sample space, if we want to, we can say comma zeta or comma omega to indicate exactly which event has occurred in the sample space. So the real big differences here really are just kind of notation in terms of using parentheses instead of brackets. And then the primary difference is that we now have things indexed on a continuous parameter time. And again, this continuous parameter, t, can be from any arbitrary set of continuous values, but more often than not, we choose it to be the real line, so t can take on any value between minus infinity or infinity, and then it really is just this continuous random signal. Okay, so now let's more rigorously define what we mean by a random process. So at the heart of all of this is, again, a probability space. Just for like the random sequences, since random sequences really are just a collection of random variables at each discrete time index n, at each time index n we had to have a probability space defined. Same thing here. At the heart of things is a probability space because at every continuous time t we have a random variable. So random variables are defined on probability spaces. So really at the core of a random process is a probability space. So we have our typical probability space, omega, f, and p. Zetas are from the sample space omega. And x, all it is, is a mapping from our sample space to the collection of continuous time functions. So this sentence right here about this x being a mapping is just a fancy way of saying 
when we do an experiment, which we can kind of picture as picking randomly some event out of omega, what comes out is a continuous time function. So another way of saying that is I have this kind of bag of signals, and when I do an experiment, I reach into the bag and I grab one, and what comes out is actually a signal. So I can think of it as the signal x of t comma zeta. Zeta indicates the exact one that I grabbed out of my bag, but once I've chosen it, what I actually have is a function of time, and I can plot that signal as a function of time. The random part comes from the fact that when I reach into the kind of bag of signals, so to speak, I don't know which one I'm going to get. So the things that we used to picture for random sequences, we used to kind of picture kind of this pile of signals or bag of signals. We're going to do the exact same thing for random processes. Again, the only difference being we now have a continuous time parameter instead of a discrete time parameter. Okay, so if we have a probability space and we have this mapping from omega to continuous functions, then this mapping is a random process if for every time t, x of t comma zeta is a random variable. So that's the requirement. We need for every time t, no matter which time I pick, if I hold t fixed, if I go across the ensemble, what I have is a random variable. Some other definitions just briefly. If we pick just one of these signals, x of t comma zeta, just one example, the nomenclature we use for that is what we call a sample function. So when I plot one instance of the continuous time random process, what I have plotted is called a sample function of the random process. And then if we want to be really rigorous and we kind of write this more in a measure theory sense, here's what we mean for this definition to hold true. For any t that I pick, x of t of zeta has to be in f. And what does it mean to be in f? What it means is the set of all zetas such that x of t comma zeta is less than or equal to x for any arbitrary x I want to pick. This set is a subset of f. That is the more rigorous kind of measure theory definition of what it means to be a random process. And we need this to be true because remember, our probability measure operates on sets. Okay, so this right here is a set. This is the set that consists of all the elements from our sample space omega such that x of t comma zeta is less than some arbitrary number I've chosen. So once we form this set, it is a subset of f and thus it can be measured by the probability measure function. So all of this should sound very familiar to what we just did for random sequences. We've now defined what a random process is. It is just a collection of random variables organized by the continuous time parameter t. Now that we have that basic definition done, let's go ahead and define some other quantities related to random processes.